Hello and welcome to the channel. The other day I came across an article about Geddy Lee and who he rates as his top 10 bassist and I thought that would make an interesting video to look at those choices and to explore what makes those guys such masters of the bass guitar. Geddy says, back in my early days no one chose to be the bass player. Everybody wanted to play the guitar. Everybody wanted to be Hendrix or Clapton or Jimmy Page. The band I was in had a vote and I became the bass player. He found though he soon fell in love with the instrument and over the last 55 years he's become an amazing player. He has this ability to play these incredibly complex bass lines, hold down the rhythm when he needs to and add in as he calls them zoomers, little bass moments, fills and runs that he fits in wherever he thinks is appropriate. He beautifully describes his growth as a player like this. As you get older, you want to look at the neck of your instrument with less and less mystery. You have to keep finding these areas of familiarity so you can choose to go there and it always adds a different tone or colour to your playing. If you take a close look at Geddy's choices, they all offer fascinating insights to Geddy's playing and the evolution of his bass guitar style. So in no particular order, Paul McCartney, John Paul Jones, Les Claypool, Jack Cassidy, Chris Squire, Jack Bruce, Jacob Astorius, Jeff Berlin, and last but not least, John Entwistle. First up, Paul McCartney. I guess from around the mid 60s, around the time of Rubber Soul and the band stopped touring. The Beatles stopped touring and became, in essence, just a studio band. My appreciation of Paul's playing just grew and grew and grew. Take a listen, for example, to the bass lines on Something, where he creates a counter melody to the verse vocal line, or the sinuous, bluesy lines he adds to I Want You, She's So Heavy. McCartney was never really into busy bass lines. He just added what was needed for each song. And this is why a lot of the players who came after him just really loved him. All those wonderful melodic lines and all those wonderful, just simple bass lines, simple inventive bass lines that just added so much to the Beatles sound. Geddy Lee, he often gets overlooked as a bass player, but as a pop bassist, he had such melodic invention. One of my personal favorites is the wing song, Feel Like Letting Go, off of Venus and Mars, where he plays the funky, funky lines that just drive the song along. Number two, Jack Bruce. Geddy Lee. Cream were in my early days as a musician, far and away my favorite band. And when Rush started out, Cream were a huge influence on us. I got to see them in Toronto in 1969. It was mind blowing, a real highlight for me. Jack was someone I looked up to, as a composer, as a singer, and as a bass player. One thing Geddy noted is that when you have a three-piece band, the bassist has to work really, really hard and make some real noise. Otherwise, the sound is just empty. Neil Peart, as the music in Rush became more and more complicated, I suggested to Geddy, maybe we should get someone in to help out with some of the parts and take some of the weight off of you. It was a mark of pride that he never would surrender that. One thing you can say about Rush, their sound was never, ever empty. In Cream, you had one of the best guitarists around, Eric Clapton, one of the best drummers, Ginger Baker, and one of the best bassists, Jack Bruce, all vying for attention and trying to make their presence felt. Cream would start a song like Spoonful or Crossroads, and they'd never be afraid to jam out. And each one of those guys were just ferocious musicians. And they would push the song, they would push the song and keep pushing it. And you know what? It never got boring. It never got dull. They just kept on pushing it with such intensity. But amongst that intensity, Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker just didn't get on. And it was only a matter of time before Cream decided 
enough was enough. In the introduction to the 2010 book, Jack Bruce composing himself, Eric Clapton wrote this. It was not volume or technique or virtuosity that defined Jack's presence on stage. It was his obvious desire to make the most out of every musical opportunity. The music and the experience of playing it took me to another dimension. So please check out Cream's discography and also, as Geddy says, Jack's solo projects. Most notably, the classic Songs for a Tailor. Number three, Jack Cassidy. Geddy says the other bassist that grabbed his ear in the late 60s, besides Jack Bruce, was another Jack, Jack Cassidy. He says, I always found his playing to be very underrated. You have this trippy, psychedelic band, Jefferson Aeroplane, with Jack's aggressive playing. That pushed the band along. There's a song of theirs called The Other Side of This Life that we used to cover back in the early days of Rush. If you listen to Jefferson Aeroplane's 1969 live album, Bless Its Pointed Little Head, on the intro, Jack comes in with this angry circular pattern. If you listen closely, you'll hear there is a nod to Jack in my sound. And when you hear Cassidy talking about his early days and his introduction to the instrument, he describes it exactly like Geddy, i.e. I loved that sonic arena the bass gave me. Cassidy goes on to say, all my heroes were the stand-up bass players, like Charles Mingus. Like these players, Cassidy loved these long, fluid runs. He says, I was always chasing those jazz players. The album we mentioned earlier, the live album from 1969, Jefferson Airplane's live album from 1969, bless its pointed little head. Jack is on fire through the whole record. The whole album is basically the rest of the band trying desperately to keep up with Cassidy and his amazing bass playing. John Paul Jones. Geddy. John Paul is such an all-round musical talent and such a fluid bass player. I interviewed him in London when I was working on my book. He played Heartbreaker and everyone in the room stopped moving, talking. It was all about a man on his 62 jazz bass. John Paul Jones is recognised as one of rock's great bassists. In his time with Led Zeppelin, his bass lines would often get overlooked, like many great bass players. But when you listen to these bass lines, you realise that without his contributions, Zeppelin would not have been the same band. I always felt that John's time, his years as a session musician, really helped Zeppelin, as he could bring into the songs whatever sound or shapes or colours they required. Often when Bonham and Page were out there jamming away, John Paul would be holding it all down, holding it all together, providing that foundation that Zeppelin needed. John also played keyboards for Zeppelin, and in 1977 introduced bass pedals into Zepp's live performances. Keyboards, bass and bass pedals, does that sound like anyone we might know? John Paul Jones on his musical relationship with John Bonham. Yep, we were both huge Motown and Stax fans, and general soul music fans, which is one of the reasons I've always said that Zeppelin was one of the few bands to swing. We actually had a groove in those days. People used to come to our shows and dance, which was great. To see all the women dancing, it was really brilliant. You didn't necessarily see that at a Black Sabbath show or whatever. So we were different in that way. We were a groovy band. We used all our black pop music influences as a key to the rock that went over the top. Next up, Jaco Pistorius. Geddy Lee. I was sitting in the tour bus and somebody put Weather Report's Heavy Weather album on. And I was listening to it and thinking, oh my God, who is this player? He's extraordinary. If you ever see a film of Jacko, you will see that when he places his hand on the neck, he has these incredibly long fingers. While on the other hand, he has this crazy double jointed thumb. He was for me, the Jimi Hendrix of the bass, and I'll be covering him in more detail in the near future. The first time I heard Jacko, 
was in the long hot summer of 1976, as Weather Report's album, Black Market, became part of my soundtrack for that blistering heatwave that hit the UK. That winter, Joni Mitchell's Hijira appeared. A lot of the tracks on the album are just Joni on electric rhythm guitar and Jacko on bass. The soundscapes they create are like nothing else you will ever hear. To try and describe Jacko's playing on that album is nigh on impossible. The best I can come up with is incredible and that doesn't do it justice. His bass guitar is the lead instrument. You've got Joni on electric rhythm and Jacko's bass guitar is the lead instrument. So you have these incredible bass lines from Jacko and he is just improvising around Joni's vocals and it's something to behold. So if you love music, please do yourself a favour, go and have a listen to Hijira by Joni Mitchell. Chris Squire. When Yes formed in the late 60s, the ethos of the band was try to combine top-notch vocals, harmonies and melodies to complex, challenging music. Chris was a fantastic talent and changed the game for many bass players. He moulded technique, originality and imagination into a style that was all his own. To see Yes live, especially back in their heyday in the 1970s, was something else. The level of musicianship was off the scale. Chris often cited Jack Bruce, Bill Wyman and Paul McCartney as his influences, but it was John Entwistle that Chris admired the most. There are so many great Yes moments, Yes tracks I could recommend, but I'm going to go for Sound Chaser off of Relayer. It's when Yes ventured into jazz rock territory and Chris's bass playing is something to behold. Geddy's next choice was Les Claypool. If you take a listen to Geddy's solo album, My Favourite Headache, you'll hear a lot of Primus influences in there. That's Claypool's band Primus. Les says Geddy was an influence when he started out, but Geddy returns the compliment, saying that Claypool's style showed him that he could get much more rhythmically out of his instrument. Les Claypool, in my teens, Geddy Lee was my hero. There was nobody superior. Les Claypool's style mixes tapping, flamenco-like strumming, whammy bar bends and slapping. If you don't know Les, he's an absolutely awesome musician and well worth checking out. Next up, James Jameson. If you've heard any popular music, especially Motown and their classic songs over the years, then the likelihood is you have heard Mr. Jameson. You might not be familiar with the name, but you sure as hell will be familiar with his music. I say likely because Motown didn't list session musicians credits until 1971, but James played on most of them. Bass Player Magazine named Jameson number one in their greatest bassist of all time. When at Motown, he became part of a group of session musicians called the Funk Brothers. The brothers were jazz musicians recruited by Berry Gordy, the head of Motown, to back up his ever-growing roster of superstars. So day in, day out, the Funk Brothers had to come up with music for Tina Turner, The Temptations, Stevie Wonder, and the list goes on and on and on. And Jameson had to come up with these bass lines to hold it all together, which he did time and time and time again. Over the years, almost every bassist of note has cited Jameson's influence on their playing. Geddy says, as a kid, the radio was on all the time. Everywhere you went, the radio was on. So I was exposed to Motown and that soul music a lot. And all the early bands I played in, that's what we played, because that's what was going on. I'll leave the recommendation here to Geddy Lee. He says, if you want a masterclass on the bass, listen to River Deep, Mountain High by Tina Turner. Jeff Berlin. Geddy first got to see Jeff live when he was in the UK. Jeff was playing with Bill Bruford's band and Neil and Geddy went down to see him. Geddy says he loved Jeff's playing on record, but live he was something else. 
On stage, he sounded like he was playing two more instruments at the same time he was playing bass, a guitar and another bass. Getty's his friend, Bill Mink, said, when he was recording My Favourite Headache with Getty, he christened Getty's new funkier bass style as flamenco bass. When he toured with Primus, when Rush toured with Primus, he noticed Les Claypool's way of incorporating flamenco elements into his playing. But he also mentions when seeing Jeff that he also had, at times, a flamenco guitar style to his bass playing. Jeff is an incredible bass player. With his technical ability, dexterity and feel, he's right up there with Jacko Pistorius. Get his recommendation to hear the best of Jeff Berlin is to check out Joe Fraser, a track by Bruford. And lastly, we come to the man that Geddy Lee votes as the best rock bass player of all time, John Entwistle of The Who. The first time I ever heard a bass solo in a song was The Who's classic My Generation in 1965. I can remember thinking, what the hell was that? In 1976, I got in to see The Who live at Charlton Football Ground in London. John's bass was so loud, it sounded like miniature explosions going off every time he touched the strings. For that night, the whole of that night, John was simply on fire. For a lot of the time, it just seemed like Moon and Townsend were holding down the rhythm, while John's bass was the lead instrument. When The Who released Quadrophenia in 1973, the New Musical Express and their review of the album famously described the opening track, The Real Me, as Townsend and Entwistle enter like a boot going through a plate glass window at three o'clock in the morning. The whole album is an Entwistle bass masterclass from start to finish. John even supplies French horns to the album. I'd have to say John would be my favourite bassist of all time. Not just for technical ability, but for his feel and his touch and those incredible spidery bass lines. Oh yeah, and those vrooms. Yes, loads and loads of vrooms. Geddy Lee. John had the dexterity. It was all so fluid, man. Just a pure joy to listen to. And like I said, if you want a masterclass in the bass, it has to be Quadrophenia. Thank you for listening. It's been a great journey for me to go back and explore some of these bass players in depth and find out how they influenced Geddy Lee and what impact they had on his playing. Because Geddy Lee, for me, is one of the finest musicians that has ever graced rock music. And if you want a great Geddy Lee moment, go and have a look at him when Yes get inducted into the Hall of Fame. When Yes play, he stands in for the sadly deceased Chris Squire. And he just loves being there. There's no ego, there's nothing. He's just standing there in awe and just so happy to be around these musicians who inspired him as a youngster. So thank you for listening. There'll be a lot more Geddy Lee and Rush stuff to appear on the channel and a lot of other bits and pieces we've got planned for the next few months. So stay safe, stay well, and I'll see you in the next video. And please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Take care.